Hi, I'm Matt Hill. I'm the curriculum designer here at MRU. Here is day two of the monetary policy unit plan. Super fun day, in my opinion. Really happy uh, with this one. All right. So uh, to open for the bell ringer, we want to recall the previous day, have the students sort of try and remember what they learned in the previous day, um, talking about what is a bank run. And of course, what we're referring to here is when everyone goes and asks for their money back, at the same time from the bank, the bank will fail. So just remind your students, you know, space repetition. All right, this is, you know, this is what we did yesterday. This is a bank run. This is how banks make money. They lend out the money they have in deposits. So there's this danger that if everyone asks for their money back, they will fail. All right. So after you've kind of established what a bank run is again. Have the students think through, all right, what are the ways the government might be able to stop a bank run? Right? We don't like bank runs, like, you know, banks collapse and, you know, this can, this can be an issue. So if the government wanted to, how might they be able to stop a bank run? And so, um, you know, students may have ideas. You sort of want to guide them in um, three directions, which is um, the government can say, look, we'll guarantee the deposits so that, you know, even if your bank fails, we will insure your deposits. We'll give you um, the money. Another way they could help the banks is just lend the bank's money and say, all right, well, it looks like you need some, you know, you need some cash here to pay the depositors. So we'll lend you some money. Or they could buy those assets from the bank. Remember, oftentimes banks will have long-term assets that are not liquid. So they can't sell them right away. So what the government could come, come in and say, all right, you, you need cash. We're not just going to give you cash. Um, instead, we'll buy some of your long-term assets. And here's the cash. You can go give that to depositors. So, you know, I don't know. It depends on the level of the students, what they'll come up with. But again, you want to sort of try to guide the discussion or sort of categorize what they say under these three umbrellas, guaranteeing the deposits and getting money to banks. All right. And the two ways you can get money to banks is you can lend them money or you can just buy um their bad assets. So, you know, have a conversation, see what the students um, come up with, maybe abolish banking. Um, you know, that's not on the list, but maybe some students will say something like that. Now we have these three things in real life. So the FDIC insur insures deposits up to 250. And then we have our central bank. So the central bank of the US is called the Federal Reserve. <clears throat> and so they will lend money to banks in time of crisis, and they will buy assets from the banks in time of crisis. So, you know, sort of the framework for this is you want the students talking about how might the government step in to stop bank run. Hopefully they come up with some good ideas and you could say, all right, yes, we have these in real life. There's an analog to what y'all have come up with. All right. This is a lot of fun. So I do, I've done this a lot in my classes whenever I talk about moral hazard. And, you know, it seems like it comes out of nowhere. So the students are a little bit like, oh, what's going on here? You know, and you get some crazy answers, which is always fun. So I asked the students, all right, who's the most powerful American to ever live? And so, you know, whatever, take, obviously there's no right, there's no wrong answer. And so students will have their suppositions. You know, you can talk through those. Um, you can ask why they think this one's the most powerful. All right. Chances are they're not going to come up with the answer in the lecture. And again, there's no right or wrong answer, but we're just using this as a fun segue to talk about J.P. Morgan. Who was so powerful that he single handedly bailed out the U.S. government twice. So he bails the like basically the economy is on the brink of a collapse and he saves the economy twice uh, in the panic of 1893. He basically arranges um uh, gold reserves to stay in the U.S. They're about to leave. And then, okay, if your country's on the gold standard um, and all the gold leaves, all right, the, the, the currency and the economy is going to collapse. So he arranges to keep the gold in the U.S. Um, and then we go on to the second time that he bails out the economy, which is covered in this fun video from NPR Planet Money on the birth of the Fed. So you play the video. Um, like I said, it's a fun video uh, reenacting this panic of 1907 and how JP Morgan, what JP Morgan did. Post video questions just to make sure students understand um, how does a bank run impact economic activity? What's Morgan's solution? And what is the name of the US central bank? You have answers to these, detailed answers to these in the student um, activity um, sheets. But basically, 
what we're doing in the video is we're segueing from, all right, there's no central bank. There was no central bank in this time period. And then we get a central bank. And so it sort of seeds the idea of what the one of the main purposes of a central bank, why you would want a central bank, all right? And the answer is, well, maybe it's not such a good thing to have one guy um, uh, who has to bail out the U.S. economy every time uh, it gets in trouble. All right. So then we get our central bank, um, the Federal uh, Reserve, all right? And the origin of it is the lender of last resort, you know, sort of the J.P. Morgan um, in the present, he can the, the the Federal Reserve can step in and lend to banks in time of uh, crisis. Now they have a much broader, um, much broader tools in the present, um, which we call monetary policy, and there they are affecting the supply of money, and they do this to influence the economy. All right, so as you know, when it started, it really trying to just be a lender of last resort, and sort of. As time has gone on, we, we they more broadly conduct monetary policy, which is sort of managing the overall economy by or influencing the overall economy by managing the supply of money. All right. So these are particularly their tools. We're going to put them under four categories. Lender of last resort, open market operations, which is sometimes called quantitative easing, easing. Um, changing the administered rate, we'll cover this in detail in day three, and then coordinating expectations was sort of nebulous, but actually very important, which is why it's in um, this unit plan, even at the high school level, we, we kind of want to talk about it. We'll talk about it in um, day four. All right, so lender of last result, resort. When there's a financial panic, the problem is the risk of contagion. One bank fails. Now, even if my bank is good, even my bank has not made any risky investments, I start to think, mm, if that bank can fail, maybe my bank can fail. And so, and as we covered in day one, even if the bank is solvent, even if it's like a good bank, if everybody asks for their money back out of that bank, the bank will fail. So we can have this domino effect from one bad bank into all the good banks, into the non, like the to totally solvent, totally non-risky asset, asset banks, this domino effect can happen. Um, and so this risk, risk of contagion and also called systemic risk. So the Fed's there to step in and lend the banks money. So they can step in and say, all right, look, don't worry. Uh, don't uh, Professor Hill, don't worry about your bank. Um, you know, we're going to lend it money. So it'll, it'll be fine. Now they can also buy the assets from the, from the bank in the, in the opening. This is what we covered. There are a couple different ways a central bank can get money to uh to 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 um to just regular banks they can lend the money or they can buy assets okay so this slide has a lot of text and we apologize we try to keep things sparse on the slides but uh monetary policy um well, what can we say it's it, it it's 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 very complicated we tried to make it as simple as possible for the high school level um and also we wanted to have enough text on there so that you know uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if you have this experience where you get the slides, you sort of edit the slides, you make the slides. You can always make these less, you know. Um, and then you haven't taught something in like, like a year. You go back to your slides, and you're like, I have no idea what I'm trying to say on these slides. So we're trying to give you more information than, um, than uh than required. So you you know you can always look at the slides and be like, okay, that's that's what this is about. All right. So open market open market operations and quantitative easing. Um, what they refer to is buying or selling assets from banks. So the central bank coming in and saying, all right, we are going to buy some of those assets off you banks or in reverse, hey, we're the central bank. We'd like to sell you um, some of our assets. All right. So buying bank assets in the time of crisis, this is sometimes referred to as quantitative easing. So you may have heard this terminology after the financial crisis. So this is where this really came in. Um, it's essentially just buying assets in the time of crisis. Um, kind of a specific scenario of the open market operations, which is just the general term for buying or selling assets from banks. As a recent example, uh, well, I don't know how recent it is when, <laughs> whenever you're watching this, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, the Fed um, steps in and buys lots of assets from the banking system to sort of reassure people, hey, you know, uh, the entire system is not going to fail because of this uh, global um, pandemic. Then we have this fun activity that we um, that we have in our unit plans a lot. We have the storyline activity. 
And in these, if you haven't seen them before, what we ask students to do is sort of trace out what they think um, a graph looks like. It's a kind of a more fun way of introducing graphs than just, just flashing a graph. So here we're asking about the total assets held by the central bank, all right? So I'm just sort of guessing, I can't remember exactly what this looks like. Uh, maybe something like this probably. Yeah, something like this. All right, so let's see what it actually looks like. Ooh, 90% accurate, all right. So the point of this, though, is what you can see here is you can see the crises. So you can see this run up in the Fed buying assets during the financial crisis. And then you can see the pandemic right here. All right. Where they're buying a bunch of assets, again, to, uh, 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 to stop that systemic risk. Okay. All right. So thus far, we have a... Um, we have the beginning where we're asking students, how would you solve the bank run issue? Then we talk about how it's solved in the real world with a central bank. So we went through the origin of that central bank in the, in the United States. It's called the Federal Reserve. We went through we that fun NPR video that gives us the origin of our central bank, which is job in times of crisis is to step in, lender of last resort, quantitative easing, buying these assets off of our banks. And so they don't go under. We have this nice activity showing that, like, okay, here they stepped in at the, the the great financial crisis. They step in during the pandemic, buying the assets. Now we want to think through, there are always trade-offs, all right? In economics, there's no free lunch. So there's always trade-offs. So what is the downside of this system where the central bank can step in and bail banks out? Okay. And to do that, we're going to play a game. So in the first part of the game, you're going to flip a coin. The teacher's going to flip a coin. And students can choose option one, getting a dollar no matter what, or option two, which there's some risk. You're going to get $3 if it's head, $3 if it's tails. You're going to play 10 rounds of this or five rounds, however however long you you, you think you need. Okay. Now, what you, what, what you should see is the winning strategy is option one here, all right? The safer asset that just pays a dollar no matter what. So if you do this enough time, whatever student wins, whoever has the most money at the end, so you can give out prizes as well. Some of our MRU stickers, if you want. Um, but the winning student should have taken the more conservative strategy of just getting that dollar that has a higher expected value than this option two. All right, so play play it a while. Give some presents out to the winners, some prizes, and ask the winning student what their strategy was. Hopefully, it's option one, should be. Um, you know, if you do it enough rounds, statistically, it should be this one. All right. Then you change it and you say, all right, we're going to play again. But now if uh, option two has no risk. So if it's tails, you just get zero. You don't, you don't lose any money, you just get zero. Okay. You play 10 rounds this time. Again, give some prizes to the winner. Now what you should see here is option two is now better than option one. The winning student should have gone for option two, um, you know, much more often, unless like for some reason, again, statistically, if you do enough times, that's what should happen all right okay so again the debrief who won each part you should see option one dominates in part one option two in part two and so the point of this game is to introduce the idea of moral hazard okay so now that we have a central bank that is serving as a lender of last resort or buying up the assets of banks when they get in trouble this is a safety net for banks and so if there's a safety net, the danger is the banks take much more take on much more risk than they would otherwise. So you can going back to the game, you know, in part one, if you want to win, you got to take the less risky asset. In part two, if the central bank has removed the downside, well, go ahead, opt for the risky asset. So the concern is now that we have this lender of last resort, central bank, we've introduced moral hazard to the system where we've incentivized banks to behave in more risky fashions. Okay. Now the government tries to handle this by regulating banks tightly so that they try to they try to mitigate the moral hazard problem by making sure the banks don't take on too much risk. But you know, this is obviously not a perfect system, as we've seen in 2023, as you know, several banks um failed. Uh, all right, so we have a fun analogy here. Again, we always like to use the analogizing um, science learning technique. 
So just ask the students, you know, do you play a video game different if you have limited lives versus infinite lives? Um, you know, I don't know if they're like me, but if they are like me, they, you play the game way different. Um, and so this is moral hazard. You know, basically, if I if you're removing the risk, people are going to behave in much more risky fashions. So again, we're sort of in this in this lesson. What we're doing is, and we'll just end the lesson. We're sort of setting up the role of the Fed. At least one of the roles of the Fed is to kind of guarantee the banking system because we've identified this issue of bank runs in day one. Ah, here's the solution in day two. Um, but you know, there's always a trade-off, moral hazard. And so, yeah, this is how the system works. These are the potential issues um with it. Okay. And this is what you're asking in the in the exit ticket. What are the pros and cons of the Fed acting as a lender of last resort? The pros being they are stemming uh this uh, systemic risk, um, you know, trying to remove contagion from the system, but they are creating moral hazard. All right, that's day two. Like I said, fun day. We got an NPR video. We got an interactive uh, data thing going on. Um, we got a, who's the greatest American? Or sorry, most powerful American. And we got a game. All that in one day. You can get the Monetary Policy Unit Plan here or click for the next video.